Now, The Enemies We Face, Part 4, The Church's Victory. This is the fourth and final session of our series of talks on the theme of The Enemies We Face. We, of course, being God's people, the Church of Jesus Christ. In the previous two talks, I've dealt with what I believe to be the two main enemies that confront the church today. The first is witchcraft. The second is the spirit or the power of antichrist. Witchcraft I defined as really the universal religion of fallen humanity. The means by which men through all the ages have sought to make contact with Satan's rebellious kingdom of angels in the heavenlies worshipping them in some way or other as gods. Antichrist is a different kind of spiritual power that only has relevance where the gospel of Jesus has first been proclaimed. I pointed out that the word anti has two meanings. First of all, against. Secondly, in place of. And the pressure of the spirit of Antichrist is against Jesus, the true Messiah, to eliminate him, but then the second move is to replace him by a false messiah. And I suggested to you that spiritual force is very actively at work in the church today. I also tried to give you just a little picture of what I believe the final manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist, the beast, will be like. <clears throat> Now I want to move on from the negative to the positive. In this final talk, I want to deal with the church's victory. I've tried to briefly define the main enemies we face with the purpose of showing how we can obey God and overcome those enemies by the means that he has provided. The first thing I think we need to understand is this, that all the promises that close the Bible, all the promises in the book of Revelation, the final revelation of Jesus to his church, all the positive promises are only for those who overcome. There are no promises for the defeated. Paul said, do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil by good. I believe we have only two options in the last resort. We either overcome or we are overcome. There is no third ground. And there are no positive promises of God whatever for those who allow themselves to be overcome. In the chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we have a word that Jesus sent to each of seven churches and every final promise to each of those seven churches is to the one who overcomes. There are no promises to the ones who do not overcome. I think we need to face this very seriously. God has made it possible for us to overcome. He expects us to overcome. And then that is really summed up in one verse near the end of Revelation, in chapter 21 and verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So the overcomer gets everything, and the one who does not overcome gets nothing. It is either, it's total one way or the other. I think one of the great deceptions that the devil foists upon the Christian church is to somehow convince us there's some middle ground. Well, I'm not really an overcomer, but I don't want to accept the fact that I'm overcome. I don't think the New Testament indicates there is any such middle ground. So we're talking now about overcomers. Every now and then some new group emerges within the church who claim to be the overcomers. In the course of my Christian experience, which has lasted nearly 50 years, I could name two or three different groups. I want to tell you this. If you ever encounter a group 
who tell you that if you want to be right, you've got to join us. You can be sure of one thing. If you join them, you're wrong. <laughs> no one has a monopoly of overcoming. All right? it's, it's not a label. It's not a doctrine. It's a life. All right, now we're, we're speaking to overcomers, to those who are convinced by faith in Scripture and in Jesus that it's possible to overcome. The first thing we need to understand in dealing with these satanic forces is very important and very basic. It is that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has already administered to Satan a total permanent, final, irreversible defeat. Okay? If you don't understand that, you don't have any basis for victory. Let me say those words again. A total, permanent, final, irrevocable defeat. There's nothing that Satan can do that can ever change that fact. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And it's finished. Nothing needs ever to be added to what he did, and nothing can ever be taken away from what he did. Uh, this is stated in one, very place, one place very clearly is in Colossians, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. <clears throat> now these are complicated uh, statements, and I could spend the rest of this session trying to explain what they mean, but I don't intend to do that. I just want to pinpoint certain statements. Colossians 2, beginning at verse 13. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, that is God the Father, has made alive together with him, Jesus Christ the Son, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Let's, let's start with the closing verse. The, the principalities and powers referred to there are the same as we saw earlier in Ephesians 6.12. Our wrestling match is against principalities and powers, the various levels and orders of Satan's kingdom. That is what we are fighting against. But we need to understand that Jesus has already ministered a total public defeat. The word used there is he has triumphed. You need to understand what a triumph is. It's part of the, um, the culture of the Roman Empire. When a Roman general was particularly successful in war, when he returned to Rome, the Senate of Rome voted him a triumph. And in this triumph, he was placed in a chariot drawn by a white horse. And he was led through the streets of Rome. And all the people of Rome lined the streets applauding him. And behind him were all the evidences of his victories. The rulers, the commanders that he had defeated were led in chains behind him. Then great numbers of prisoners were led behind him. And in some cases, even wild animals from the te conquered territories. Animals maybe the Roman people had not seen. So this is a triumph. It's not winning the victory. It's the celebration of the victory that has already been won. And Paul, in this language, is saying that by his death and resurrection, Jesus was placed in the triumphal chariot and led through the unseen world. And behind him were all the forces of Satan led in chains. That's the totality of the victory. Now, to obtain this victory, Jesus did two things for us. And I'm, I can only touch on them briefly. The first relates to the past. We need to bear in mind that Satan's great weapon against us is guilt. As long as he can keep us guilty, we are no match for him. But in this victory, Jesus dealt with the problem of guilt. 
First, in regard to the past, he made it possible for us to be forgiven all our previous sins. It says, having forgiven you all trespasses. That little word, all, is very important. We have to believe that every sin we've ever committed has been forgiven. If we have even one unforgiven sin, it's a lever that Satan can use against us to frustrate us and make us ineffective. The other thing is more complicated, but let me just say it briefly. Jesus has abolished the law of Moses as the means to achieve righteousness with God. Not abolished it as part of the word of God or part of the history of Israel. It's not abolished all the lessons that come to us from the law of Moses, but he has abolished the law of Moses as the requirement for achieving righteousness with God. As long as the law was the requirement, every time we wanted to claim righteousness, Satan could stand there and point to some commandment, some ordinance that we had not obeyed and said, there you are, they have no right of approach. But when Jesus died on the cross, he put an end to the law in that aspect. And the scripture says very, very vividly, he nailed it to the cross. So when we go beyond the cross, we're not under the law. Now our righteousness does not depend on keeping commandments. It depends on faith. We are justified, made righteous by faith. This is always so vivid to me in regard to the dealings of Jesus with Peter. At the Last Supper, Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the night is out. Of course, Peter said he wouldn't, but you know he did. Then Jesus said, but I have prayed for you, not that you will not deny me, but what? That your faith will not fail. If you can keep believing, your faith will take you through. So never get moved away from your faith. Let no failure, let no accusation, nothing ever move you from your faith that Jesus died in your place, bore your sins, was made sin for you, and has offered you the garment of his spotless righteousness. You know what to be justified means? This is not part of my message, but it's so important. It's a, it's a legal phrase. You've been tried by the court of heaven, and the court has handed down its verdict. And the verdict is not guilty. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Not guilty. Satan, you can say what you like. You can point out all my sins and all my failings and all my inadequacies. And I'll agree with you. <laughs> I'll probably tell you some you don't know about. <laughs> but the court of heaven has said, Not guilty. I am reckoned righteous, made righteous, justified. You know what I say? Just as if I'd never sinned. That's it. And when you stand on that ground, you are more than a conqueror of Satan in the conquest that Jesus has already won. If we start from any other basis, we'll never achieve victory. The only basis is the cross. And then having deprived Satan of his weapons against us, and the one great sovereign supreme weapon is guilt, Jesus has equipped us with the weapons with which to defeat Satan. That's the second part of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, <coughs> verses 3, 4, and 5. Ruth and I make this confession. I think we'll do it together. This is, we have a number of scriptures, I mean probably 50, that we proclaim as part of our spiritual warfare. And this happens to be one. So you talk close to the microphone. Okay. For though we walk in the flesh, we war not after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing which exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What a victory that is, isn't it? Amen. Thank you so much. You see, we have weapons that are not carnal. So what are they? They're not carnal, what are they? 
spiritual. In other words, we don't use bombs or tanks or rifles because we're not fighting persons with bodies. They're useless. But we have been given in place of those physical material weapons, spiritual weapons, that we can use and this is what we are to use them for. Pulling down strongholds. Whose strongholds? Yeah. Satan's. That's right. If you notice the next verse, there are various alternative translations. You can have arguments, reasonings, speculations. And then it speaks about the mind and the thought. So we discover the battlefield. Very important to know what the battlefield is. It's the mind. How many of you realize that? Most of your problems as a Christian are in the area of the mind. Don't let that discourage you. That's where the war is. But we've been given the weapons of victory. And we can pull down Satan's strongholds or roadblocks or fortresses. You see, Satan builds up fortresses in the minds of men and women to prevent them being able to receive the truth of the gospel. And one of our functions is by the spiritual weapons God has given us, prayer, preaching, praise, and so on, to break down those strongholds and open the way for the word of God to enter and to save people and to change them. We dealt, for instance, with two anti-Christian forces, Judaism and Islam, in our last talk. Each of them has a specific stronghold that you have to break down. The stronghold in the Jewish mind is, if I believe in Jesus, I'll no longer be Jewish. You may not be aware of that, but that is the strongest barrier that they have against receiving the truth about Jesus. The Muslim stronghold is, God doesn't need a son. There isn't a son of God. And if you're going to reach either Jews or Muslims effectively, you're going to have to use these spiritual weapons to break down those strongholds before you can really make an impact on them. So we have the weapons for victory. Notice the ultimate aim is to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's a staggering assignment. First of all, we have to release people's minds from the false captivity of Satan. And then we have to bring their minds into captivity to obedience to Jesus. That's wonderful, isn't it? But we've been given the weapons to do it. Now, my talk tonight is not on those weapons. I've given many talks on that theme in the past. But I want to deal just with certain general basic requirements if the church is to be victorious. I'm going to deal with them briefly. I have actually listed seven. You could probably make it eight or you could make it six. But in my making of outlines, when I get to the number seven, I usually stop. All right. Let's turn to Matthew 12, 25. Here's a statement by Jesus, which is extremely important. And I think I'm afraid the church has often ignored it. Matthew 12, 25. Jesus said, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. We've spoken about the kingdom of God. But if the kingdom of God is divided against itself, it cannot win. So Satan's primary attack on the church is to divide us. Has he been successful? I'm sorry to say, he's been extremely successful. And one thing we have to do is resist division. That does not mean that we automatically associate ourselves with everyone or everything that's called Christian. But it means that wherever there are people who are true believers in Jesus, according to the scripture, and committed to love him and serve him, we have to acknowledge them as our brothers and sisters. And we do not let unnecessary barriers come between them and us. Ruth and I, in our ministry, we work with I don't know how many different ministries and persons around the world. And basically, I could say we don't have any problems in our relationships with them. I think the primary reason is because they and we are committed to something positive. And we're committed to Matthew 24, 14. 
this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. We believe this is our responsibility to prepare the way for the Lord by proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. And wherever we meet with people who have that primary aim based on scripture, we may never have met them before, but in 10 minutes we feel like we've known them all our lives. So let's not focus on the negative. Let's focus on the positive. You find where people are truly committed to prayer and intercession or to evangelism, the barriers melt. But where people are all tied up with church structure and programs, there usually are problems. So the first thing we have to do is guard against division. It's not easy. We certainly don't have all the answers. But when we give it due priority, I think we'll be nearer to achieving it. Then the second thing we have to do, and this is tremendously important, is to know and proclaim the whole of God's word. And I want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This has become a very significant chapter for me recently because I think it's a picture of the last days. Uh, if you begin at the first verse of 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. And the whole of this third chapter deals with things that are particularly relevant to the last days. The first thing it does is to paint a picture of the general degeneration of human character and conduct as the age comes to its close. And Paul picks out 18 major moral or ethical blemishes which will characterize humanity at the close of this age. And really the root of them all is selfishness. Love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure. I don't know three words that better describe our contemporary civilization than that. Love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure. All the others are within that context. The great enemy is selfishness. We need to bear that in mind because the fact that we don't indulge in drugs or alcohol or immorality does not necessarily separate us from the world. The only thing that really separates us is unselfishness. And I think a lot of moral, good living churchgoers are basically extremely selfish people. It's number one first. And we need to understand that isn't the distinctive mark of the church in these, in these days. The distinctive mark is unselfishness, a commitment to God and to humanity to serve and be servants. Then Paul goes on from there and he points out various other features of the close of the age, some we will return to perhaps later, he very clearly depicts a tremendous upsurge of the occult, which again is very conspicuous in our time. And then he comes to what I believe is God's answer at the end of chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. How much of Scripture? Oh, are you sure? <laughs> so a lot of people are not sure about that any longer. There's a lot of preachers that believe it's their job to straighten God out and edit the Bible and point out where it needs to be changed. That is not my attitude, I want to say. I believe all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I understand that to mean that for God's people to be thoroughly equipped, the whole truth of the Bible has to be presented to them, not just little passages. You have to know what is in the book of Ezra. You have to know the teaching of Amos. You have to understand the epistle to, the, to Philemon, see because they're all necessary for you to be thoroughly equipped. 
you may have to take much less time in front of the television if you're going to be thoroughly equipped. Because it's a pretty full-time job being thoroughly equipped for Christian service. Now, bear in mind the chapter divisions were not there by Paul, from Paul. So Paul goes on in the next chapter, the first verse, I charge you therefore. What's the therefore for? You've heard me say this. When you find a therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. That's right. Because of what he said at the end of chapter 3, then he comes to this tremendously solemn charge. Look at the words. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You couldn't have a more solemn charge than that. In the, as it were, in the presence of God and in the light of the fact that we'll all have to answer to Jesus at his judgment seat when he comes. So what's the message? Verse 2, preach the word. Let's say that together, shall we? Preach the word. I put the in with thing. Let's do it, do it my way this time. Preach the word. All right. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Let me ask you a frank question. You don't have to answer. How many of you go to church on Sunday morning expecting to be convinced, rebuked, and exhorted? Some of you wouldn't go back to that church again if they treated you like that. <laughs> but if the minister's doing his job, that's what will happen to you. Now, how true this is of the time in which we live. For the time will come, I believe the time has come, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I think this is conspicuous in the Western church. There are many, many Christians who have to have a new doctrine, a new revelation, something new to tickle them and excite them. But that's not our job. Our job is to preach the word. And so Paul concludes this section. But you, that's Timothy, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I don't believe there's ever been a time when it's more important to hold fast to the absolute truth and authority of Scripture. It's being attacked and undermined in many quarters which we wouldn't anticipate. Movements and churches and groups that we would consider to be sound in the faith have moved from that foundation in these last few decades. Let me quote the words of Paul to you in Acts 20:27. 20, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I'm impressed by those words, I have not shunned, because it would indicate that there's a lot of pressures that would cause you not to declare the whole counsel of God. Is that true? Yeah. Social pressures, financial pressures, denominational pressures. You want to be popular, it might easily be the quickest way not to declare the whole counsel of God. But remember that we are answerable ultimately to God. Paul said, I'm pure from the blood of all men. I think he was thinking in terms of God's word to Ezekiel. I've made you a watchman to your people. If trouble is coming and you warn them and they don't listen, they'll perish. But you've saved your soul. But if trouble is coming and you don't warn them and they perish, their blood will be upon your hands. And I think Paul said, for that reason, I'm pure from the blood of all men. No one's blood can be laid at my door because I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. The third requirement, I think, is very important. It's stated in 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 5 and 6. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Now, being over 70, of course, I can say a hearty amen to that. 
But it isn't, doesn't end there, see. Yes, all of you, over 70, or over 50, or under 20, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. See, there's been a lot of talk in the church recently about submission. And I believe submission has a scriptural basis. I point out to most people what really matters is not submission, but submissiveness. <coughs> you can be submissive even when you don't submit. It's the attitude rather than the code of conduct. Peter says, all of you be clothed with humility. That's a metaphor that doesn't come out in the English. The word he uses means put on an apron of humility. And the word is used for an apron that was worn only by slaves. So when you had this apron on, everybody knew you were a slave. So he says, put on an apron, an attitude of humility, which shows you're the slave of everybody. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I always point out to people, humility is not something God can do for us. God never says, I will make you humble. God always says, make yourself humble. It's a decision. We have to make it. And then, I won't turn there, but if you're interested, there's a remarkable example in Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 through 23, of one specific way of humbling ourselves. Ezra and the party of exiles returning from Babylon to Jerusalem were confronted with a very dangerous journey that took them, I think, four months. They had with them all the precious vessels of the temple and their wives and their children. But Ezra refused a military escort from the Persian monarch and said, we're going to trust God. He had to do that because he testified that God protected those who served him. See, that's one of the blessings of testifying. When you testify, you have to live up to your testimony. So he didn't ask for a band of soldiers and horsemen, but he said, we proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict or humble ourselves before God and seek of him a right way. And this is totally scriptural. I don't have, to go, don't have time to go into it. But one of the appointed ways of humbling ourselves is by fasting. David said in Psalm 35, 30, 13, I humbled my soul with fasting. Why does your soul need to be humbled? Because it's the arrogant, self-seeking ego in you. It's the thing that says, I want, I think, I feel, I'm important, look at me. And that has to be humbled before God can really have his way in our lives. Whenever I tell this, I always think of a lawyer in Washington, D.C., some year, good many years ago now, heard me teach on fasting, he was a Christian, decided he would do it. Had a miserable day. Every time he walked past a restaurant or a delicatessen, he, his mouth watered and his stomach cramped and he wanted to go in. But he finished the day without, fast, without breaking his fast. Then in the evening, he gave his stomach a lecture. And he said, now stomach, You've been very troublesome today. You've made a lot of trouble for me. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to fast tomorrow as well. <laughs> That's how we have to deal with the, the self-assertive part of us. We have to bring it into subjection to the will and mind of God. I do believe that those Christians who do not in some scriptural way learn to practice fasting will not be able to administer the total victory of God. After all, Jesus couldn't do it. He started his ministry by 40 days of fasting. Do you think that we're further along than Jesus? He didn't say to his disciples, if you fast. He said, when you fast. He used exactly the same language about fasting in the sermon in, in chapter 6 of Matthew as he did about prayer. If he expects us to pray, he expects us to fast. Now you have to sort that out for yourselves and also you have to find out from the Holy Spirit what way and how to do it. But I would say for Ruth and myself, I, I think we could say we wouldn't dare 
to go ahead in the ministry that we're in if we didn't practice regular fasting. Because we are challenging basically all the major forces of Satan in the world today. We are challenging them head on. And we need every help that we can get from God. And one way is by fasting. I've got a little book somewhere that's entitled How to Fast Successfully. I have a week's radio teaching on fasting. I don't want to take time now, but if you're interested, you can obtain them. Going on. The next thing we must do is put on the whole armor of God. We need to turn to Ephesians 6 for a moment. Immediately after the 12th verse, which speaks about the kingdom of Satan in the heavenlies, <coughs> Paul says, in my version, that the next word is therefore. All right, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And notice you have to take it up. It doesn't grow on you. God doesn't fit it on you. You have to take it up. Now, Paul was writing to people who were Christians just as much Christians as you and I. But he placed on them the responsibility to take up the armor. And if you look through the armor, we'll go through it very quickly. <coughs> In verse 14, the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel. Verse 16, the shield of faith. <coughs> verse 17, the helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit. If you analyze that, you are completely protected from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet except for one area, which is the back. the back. That's right. If you turn your back, there's no protection. It's important to remember. But that's not the full list. There are six items there, and in the Bible, usually when a thing is complete and it's good, it's seven. And the next one is perhaps as important as any of them. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I think it's Charles Wesley who talks about the weapon of all prayer. And really all prayer is the weapon by which we can reach out into the heavenlies and attack Satan's kingdom at its base. The others are mainly weapons of self-protection. But all prayer is... If you like, it's our intercontinental ballistic missile. It can reach any target anywhere if we set the computer right. <coughs> the next thing we have to do is realize our need of God's supernatural power. And I want to say supernatural. Christianity is a religion of the supernatural. I once read through the book of Acts, examining it to see what would happen if I removed all reference to the manifestly supernatural. That's not just inward supernatural experiences, but things that are visible, that can be perceived by the senses. The book of Acts has 28 chapters. And at the end of that, I discovered not one chapter out of the 28 would be left intact if we eliminated the supernatural. And that's the only record we have in Scripture of how the church is intended to operate. We cannot operate effectively and accomplish the will of God solely by our own natural ability. We have to have the supernatural enabling of the Holy Spirit. And one main form of that enabling is the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We won't turn there, but let's look at just one statement of Paul which I think is important. It really summarizes what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. It's not a matter of theology. Theology has its place. It's not a matter of argument. It's not a matter of intellectual proof. 
It's the demonstration of the supernatural power of God. I'd like to look at the words of Paul in 1 